So our theme for the month of February is to seek the common good. And I'll bet if I gave everybody in here a piece of paper and asked them to define what the common good is, we would get a lot of different explanations. I could break it down even further and ask each of us to define each word in that. And we probably get a whole lot of different ideas about what it means to seek, what's common, and even what's good. So it's probably a good idea if we just recognize it right up front that language is limiting in terms of truth. It's uh, very similar to what was in our sacred reading. The Tao that can be named is no longer that. Okay. Words are quite literally labels of beliefs. And we share labels, but we don't necessarily share beliefs. Yet we will use the same label and think that you believe the same thing I believe. That when I say common, you're understanding that word the way I'm understanding it. <clears throat> Only in reality, not so much. <laughs> and if we have a deeper conversation with one another, we begin to understand that. And so we live in an experience that quite literally seems pretty separate from one another, does it not? I mean, we don't look the same, we don't act the same, we don't believe the same, yet we're one. How the heck does that work? Well, it works at the origination of who we are. It works at the essence of who we are. And quite literally, the form <coughs> is intentionally different. Because if we were all exactly the same, the divine's purpose to expand its experience of itself would fall miserably flat, would it not? I mean, if my goal is to experience myself, and all I do is the same thing day after day after day, where have I experienced anything other than nothing? That's why creation creates in multiplicity. Our challenge is to understand that multiplicity, that diversity, does not mean separation. And I don't know about you, but I can get there from a distance just like that. Intellectually from the neck up, no problem. And then I start encountering other people. <laughs> See, you know. <laughs> and then I actually engage with other people. And the separation seems to become even more clear. Or is it? And what I've come to understand, it's not that separation is more clear, it's that I'm more clear that I want to be separate. <laughs> Catch that? Separation isn't clear. What's clear is that I want to be separate from you. And why is that? Because I have judged that you and the way you show up is incorrect. So if you have any place in your life where you want to be separate from someone or something, and right beside that you have the notion that you don't want to be right, you are incorrect. Because the desire to separate comes from our desire to be right. It's a very human thing. It ain't a bad thing. It's just a human thing. 
How do we begin to navigate this stuff? Is we begin to unpack it. We begin to unravel it so we can understand it. Now, in the truth of oneness, every thought that has ever been thunk in the history of creation is yours. It's mine. There's no escaping it. See, we don't have, in true oneness, there's not that place of, well, I didn't think that. What a bet. There's one mind. We're all swimming in it. What is different is that we are individualized, not individual. Teaching the uh, Thomas Trevor class right now on the creative process. And we, we were kind of laughing this past week that even the title of the book is a little misleading because it says the creative process in the individual and there's no such thing. <laughs> so it would be more accurate if it said the creative process in the individualized one. That would be more accurate. They didn't call me before they talked about it. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> So here's what Thomas Troward, who influenced a tremendous amount of Armstrong's writings, says. I have already pointed out that the presence of a single, all-embracing cosmic mind is an absolute necessity for the existence of any creation, whatever, for the reason that if each, in, now listen real carefully here, because this kind, he puts it so clearly, for the reason that each individual mind were, if each individual mind were an entirely separate center of perception, not linked to other minds by a common ground of underlying mentality, independent of all individual action, then no two persons would see the same thing at the same time. In fact, no two individuals would be conscious of living in the same world. Now think about that for just a minute. If we were truly separate, truly independent, we wouldn't even know one another exists. <coughs> that would be alone. Because that's what individual really is. Completely separate. And so by virtue that we actually interact and we recognize one another, there's information of oneness, not two-ness. We get stuck in the form. Ernest Holmes teaches us over and over again to turn away from condition. This body is conditioned reality. Everything, we are all conditioned reality. All that means is we are some condition of it. We are a limited version of it. Because absolute reality, spirit, is formless. It's absolutely formless. None of us have seen it. What we have seen is the effect of its desire made manifest through the law, which is still and it's so easy to think of these things as there's spirit, then there's a separate law. No, it's all one. The law is to spirit what my finger is to my hand. It's a part of it. It's, I think that probably the best example I could give you is wetness to water. I defy you to stick your hand in water and not get wet. Wetness is an, a property of water that cannot be removed. Law is that same aspect of divinity. It doesn't think, it can't think. If it could think, then the divine could actually be against itself. It could question its own self. And it doesn't. Any more than the law questions you. 
And that's how we create in this oneness. Because the thing that the divine is, lives, moves, and has its being as you. The only thing that limits us from living in an absolute oneness with creation is us. It's our separation thinking. And when we get really clear that I am divinity in form, I'm not all of it. I am not God. I am God in form. I am spirit in form. I am individualized. And when I get that, then I change how I use the mind, my mind, the one mind. Rest assured, we are using it all the time. Because in oneness, now think about this. Imagine creation for just the, the most minute particle of time taken just the snooze. Just not going to create this moment. What would happen? It all stops. We stop. Everything ceases to be. And so in the truth of oneness, we are that in form. We are creating exactly as it is creating. Continuously, uninterruptedly. The choice is, are we going to take responsibility for what we're creating and for how we're creating and to be aware because we are creating all the time. And mostly, we're creating based on how do I put this? Socialized ingrained race thought that we have accepted as normal. Anybody have any of those little phrases that roll off the tongue? Well, that's just how it is. That's a place where we have accepted something as completely normal. Well, what can I do? That's a place where we've accepted that something is normal and the question speaks to our belief that we're powerless. It speaks to a misunderstanding of the truth of who we are. Because we can do everything. Can I change you? No. That's your job. And that's the independence. And the reason we have that independence is so that the divine can expand its experience of itself. If any one of us could control the other one, then we would be creating now exactly the way it creates, which would mean it takes away the power of choice, which means it is no longer expanding its experience of itself. Now I know this all gets really circular, but isn't one circular? <laughs> We're just going around. In our, our book that we're using this month, Ethics, Beyond Religion, Ethics for the Whole World by the Dalai Lama, he talks about ethics as our internal system of value. And that, you know, he, he tosses out the radical idea that we don't really need religion to have ethics. Now, a lot of us are real okay with that. And a lot of us, not so much. A lot of it depends on what your religion is, whether you know you think that's doable. And if we go back to this idea of normal, we begin to unravel the supremacy out of which all separation comes. And I, when I say supremacy, I literally mean supremacy anywhere. I don't care if it's economical, educational, race-related. It doesn't matter. 
Supremacy is supremacy is supremacy. And it is based on the lie that one thing is more right than another. And that when we get this one thing more right than another and we keep it there long enough, it becomes our standard of normal by which everything else becomes wrong. And in order to give right, we all have to do it this way. Now, for me, when I really got what was happening with supremacy, that flies in the face of creation itself. Because the very thing that created us said, I can't set a standard. I can't set a standard. Now, it is the source. And if it can go the way of I want to experience myself so I can't set a single standard and still do that, it got real easy for me to begin to understand all the places that supremacy was operating in my life. It got easy to backtrack out of this entanglement of sexism and racism and homophobia because quite honestly there's a whole lot of supremacy operating way below those big ones okay. who gets to turn first me or you we both get to the stoplight at the same time who gets to go first generally I do <laughs> and generally you think you do <laughs> and sometimes those result in what we call wrecks. <laughs> when we go out to eat, who orders first? See, supremacy is operating in a lot of different places. A lot. My freedom comes when I start unraveling all of those. When I find all of the places where I have separated myself in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. All of them. Not just the big ones, because they're easy. Holy cow, somebody else, and it's that's even part of the rightness because other people are telling us what we should be for. What are you for? What comes alive in you? Do that. If eating ice cream before breakfast makes you come alive, eat ice cream before breakfast. <laughs> Let go of what breakfast is supposed to look like. <laughs> and if you think you're not anchored in some level of it, go home and flip your toilet paper over the other way. <laughs> See how much angst it brings up. <laughs> it's like the ultimate. You know, when we think we have everything else all worked out, let somebody come in and turn your toilet paper upside down. <laughs> and we sit there staring at it. Well, did they not get the memo? They didn't read the book. I have literally watched adults argue for more than an hour about how toilet paper is supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> we are a funny bunch. <laughs> and if we just lean into that and quit worrying about what the other person is doing, where do you think you're right? Start there. Because if you get clear that your rightness is nothing more than how the divine wants to show up as you, and it doesn't need to go any further than you, we will all begin to relax if we would just each do that. I want to end with a reminder of the I Believe statement. Ernest Holmes said in that second one, I believe in the incarnation of the Spirit in all 
and that we are all incarnations of the one spirit. So it's in all and we are it. I believe in the eternality, the immortality, and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding. What he's saying is just as creation expands, we are here to expand the divine's experience of itself. And as we do that, we expand our own experience of ourselves and one another. Because that's the truth of oneness. It's all about expansion of experience. The final thing I'm going to point out is the word infinite. It's a really cool word. And so if you ever forget who you are, just look at that word because it tells you I am the infinite in finite. Let's take this into prayer. Hmm, how good it is. How thrilling it is to every fiber of my being to recognize that I am in the company of the one, the infinite, the ever-present allness of creation. That unseen, unseeable, infinite source of creation. The activity of its element of law moving its desires into form. And being in form, I must recognize that I am that created out of it to be it, to expand its experience of itself as my life. And so the very abilities, the very capacities, the very nature that it is, is my nature, my abilities, and my capacity. And what is true of me is true of all. And so we step into a realization of ourselves as the divine in form. And we take full responsibility to ferret out every block that we have built against being that. We allow ourselves to look, to embrace, and to use the very power that created the block to transform it to openness. One mind, one creation, one experience forever and ever expanding itself in the multiplicity of a united form, a united oneness grateful to know that this is true, has always been true, will always be true, because that's what truth is. Unchangeable. And so I release my word, which is the word of the one spoken as me, into the law of itself, into the law of myself. I release it, I let it go, knowing that the law has already acted upon it to bring it into me. And I invite you to join me as we say together. Yes. Yes.